Today we're going to look at one of the all-time classic albums. It was number one in the UK for 14 weeks, where it was the first album to be certified 10 times platinum. It is the eighth best-selling album of all time in the UK. It was number one in the US for nine weeks, where it was certified nine times platinum. It was number one in Australia for a total of 34 weeks. It has sold upwards of 30 million copies worldwide. It is the album that cemented Dire Straits in the long-term public consciousness as one of the all-time legendary bands. Yes, of course, it's the hugely iconic Brothers in Arms. The National rocketing up into the skies there, very much depicting the uh, direction that the band took with the release of this album. They did become pretty much the biggest band in the world at this stage, and the album sold in such vast quantities that uh, it almost kind of reinvented itself as a hits compilation because sim simply by virtue of the number of copies it sold, all of its nine songs became as well known as any sort of reasonably successful single. Um, so uh, a massively successful album. But perhaps um, a more appropriate edition of the album to show you would be one of these editions, the CD. Uh, because Brothers in Arms was pretty much the album that launched the CD as a format. It wasn't the very first CD to be released, but it was the first CD to be released that sold in such vast quantities. And so it very much, it was very much the dawn of, of that CD era. Um, talking of that, this edition, this particular vinyl edition, is the edition that comes with the studio albums box set and this was actually the first time that the complete album was released on vinyl this is a double album um, edition of it um, because the whole album doesn't fit on on two sides of vinyl and so they finally released the whole the whole album the whole cd album on uh, on a vinyl edition with the, with the box set um, but uh, this is one of my personal favourite albums, as well as being a hugely iconic album. And so I want, to, I want to go into some detail about this album. I'm going to look through all of the songs on it uh, individually, and uh, we'll look at um, how it was recorded, where it was recorded, and um, we'll just summarise it and look into it a bit more deeply than, than I've looked at some of the albums, uh, some of the other albums. The fact that Brothers in Arms really kind of launched that CD era um, was kind of appropriate because the album was recorded using an all digital process, uh, which was very much a kind of a state of the art recording uh, method at the time. Uh, and it seemed the natural direction to go in, uh, in terms of recording technology. Analog was going out the window and digital was coming in. Um, but uh, of course, Ironically, it's, it's been realised in the years since then that analogue is still a perfectly viable way of recording an album, especially if you're going to record something that's, that's kind of rootsy. Um, so it's indeed Mark's uh, solo albums uh, have all, all been recorded with uh, an, an element of both analogue and digital processes using, using the best of both. And analogue does have a certain warmth to it and a certain character to it that digital doesn't. With that being said, the digital recording process is part of the character of, of Brothers in Arms. It's part of what makes it what it is. Um, so even though it's, it's not the way that, that you would probably go about recording a, a, an album of the same songs now, it's, it's part of what, what gives Brothers in Arms in particular its character. So the album was co-produced by Mark Knopfler and Neil Dorsman. Uh, and of course Neil had been working with Dire Straits since the Love of a Gold album in 82, where he was the engineer, and uh, he was sort of promoted up to co-producer on Brothers in Arms. And it was recorded at a, at a very special place, which was Air Studios in Montserrat between uh, October 84 and February 85. Now, Air Studios in Montserrat became a legendary recording location. Uh, many, many hugely iconic artists recorded there. Paul McCartney recorded Tug of War and Pipes of Peace there. Um, out and drum recorded two or three albums there, including uh, Two Low for Zero, which was a, a very successful album in the early 80s. Um, who else recorded there? Uh, Duran Duran recorded there. And The Police recorded their last two albums there, uh, Ghost in the Machine and Synchronicity. And um, Sting, kind of in, in particular, fell in love with the place and he would often holiday there. And that became quite significant where Brothers in Arms is concerned, and, uh, and we'll go into that later. 
but uh, it was a, it was a beautiful place and uh, a, as I say a, a legendary location and it was built well it was opened by George Martin uh, who founded Air Studios um, in the late 70s and it was really um, the purpose of it was was so that artists could get away from um, from the media and uh, you know the prying eyes of the record company and just focus on on making an album on making a good quality album it's a bit of a sad story though with with Montserrat because um, it, it wasn't to be forever it uh, uh, in 1989 suffered damage as a result of um, uh, Hurricane Hugo a little while after the hurricane swept through damaging 90% of the buildings on the island uh, George Martin turned up uh, to to look at uh, damage control and he opened uh, one of the keyboards and it was covered in mold and he knew at that point that it was game over uh, because he immediately realized that all of the electronics were going to be ruined by uh, by moisture and and, uh, and mold and what have you and so the studio closed uh, but worse was to come, uh, because in 1995, uh, after a hundred years or so of, of sleep, uh, the volcano on the island erupted and it rendered over half the island um, uninhabitable. Uh, this is the, what's the name of the volcano now? It's the uh, Soufriere Hills uh, volcano. and. Uh, the studio as it is now is within the exclusion zone on the island and so it's not accessible anymore. It's still standing but it's it's a, essentially it's a ruin uh, and it's just essentially falling apart. And when you think of all the history of the place and you think of all the wonderful artists that recorded there, in particular um, Dire Straits and Brothers in Arms and uh, The Police with their last couple of albums, which are albums that mean quite a lot to me, um, it really is sad to think of the place just, just falling apart and, and sort of rotting away. And there are some pictures um, that have been taken uh, in, in recent years of of the um, of the studio in its present condition and it really is very very sad uh it, I mean, the, the pool is still full of water but it's all green with algae and mold and so on uh and it's it, it, there's um there's growth all over the studio overgrown weeds and ivy and it's it's just it's just a really sad sight to see when you consider all the history of the place there were a couple of personnel changes between the end of the Love of a Gold tour and the recording of Brothers in Arms. Um, Hal Linders, who had been the additional guitarist on that tour, had left the band. Um, so Mark handled the vast majority of the guitars on the album. Um, but there was also a new member, and this was a chap called Guy Fletcher. And Guy Fletcher uh, has been involved with every single thing that Mark has done ever since, uh, without fail. He has had a incalculable impacts on, on, on Mark's work over the years uh, and a very positive impact in my opinion. Uh, I, I often wonder what direction Mark's music would have taken without Guy because Guy is very much a sort of jack of all trades as uh, Mark delights in telling audiences when he's introducing the band. He is primarily a keyboard player and a backing vocalist uh, but he's also uh, very adept on the technical side of things uh, he's um, he's now Mark's co-producer and has been instrumental in in the uh, the massively high quality of of the, produ of the production of Mark's last few albums. Um, he's also a multi instrumentalist. He plays guitar. He plays drums. He plays bass. Um, and um, the story begins in 1983 or so, when. Um, in Mark's words, a uh, guy turned up at the studio with a keyboard under his arms looking for employment. And the first, the first project they worked on together was the Cal soundtrack, which uh, was released, I believe, in 1984. And that's a lovely little soundtrack. Um, it, it has um, a very strong sort of Celtic influence. There are Ulian pipes on there, whistles. And uh, I've always thought that Ulian pipes and whistles are um, the cure to all ills and there's just something so therapeutic about the sound of them 
and uh, so they play a, a significant role in um, in the Cal soundtrack. And there's some lovely, lovely instrumental pieces on on, on that soundtrack. Uh, so that was the first project that Guy worked on with Mark, and he subsequently became a member of Dire Straits um, for the recording of Brothers in Arms, and remained with the band and has uh, continued working with Mark ever since. So uh, he was a hugely sig significant um, addition to the band. Terry Williams was still in the band at this stage. Um, however, for the most part, he actually didn't make it onto the album because during the course of the recording of the album, Neil Dorsman pointed out that um, the tone of his drums didn't quite fit with the sound of the album. And I can, as, as, as brilliant a, a drummer as Terry is, I can kind of understand where he was coming from there because um, I can imagine the tone of his drums would have been a bit too, for want of a better word, thunderous uh, for the nature of Brothers in Arms. They needed something that sounded a little bit kind of brighter and more taut, more elastic. Um, and so they brought in a chap called uh, Omar Hakim. Now Omar was actually in Sting's band at the time. He was in Sting's first solo band, uh, the Blue Turtles. Terrific drummer. And um, he recorded all of the drums for Brothers in Arms in the space of about uh, two days. And um, quite an undertaking, really, to, to record the drums for such a seminal album, and an, al an album that was being recorded uh, with such a, a level of attention to detail, you know, in two days. Um, that's uh, quite an achievement. But he, he was a terrific drummer, he did a great job. However, ironically, the drumming highlight of the album actually came from Terry. Uh, because he played the big uh, drum fill build up to the guitar riff, the iconic guitar riff on Money for Nothing. And uh, that's, a, that's a big highlight of the album. So although he's, for the most part, not on the album, he had one of the biggest sort of highlights uh, of, the, of the whole album. So looking at the songs on the album, it did return to a slightly more conventional sort of songwriting approach. Um, whereas Love Over Gold, only had five songs on it and yet it lasted over 40 minutes it was almost on a sort of prog rock level brothers in arms in terms of its songs is comparatively slightly more conventional although it still had some fairly lengthy songs on there uh, such as the um, the full version of brothers in arms which is oh seven or eight minutes long and why worry is a similar length because of its extended outro and so it still had that sort of progressive um, experimental element on there which set it apart from the typical sort of generic, generic um, uh, chart pop that was prevalent at the time. Um, this, this was very much the mid 80s. This was the, the era of, of synth pop. And um, Brothers in Arms was, was distinct from that, even though it used elements of, of, 80s, of typical 80s production. Um, it was the most polished production of, uh, of all of Die Straits albums up to that point. Uh, they gave themselves plenty of time to, to focus on making this album. And um, it's, uh, it, it really does have a, a, a depth of texture to it. Um, they, they, there's, there's quite a lot of attention to detail that's gone into, that's gone into making the album. And um, as a result of that, it was quite, um, and also because of its digital recording process, it was a, a very good album to test your new hi-fi system out on, you know, uh, especially with the new CDs. So, um, so yeah, this this album really was a sort of a step up from what they had what they had done previously. So the album opens with uh, "So Far Away," which was also the lead single from the album, and uh, a very appropriate choice, I think, for a lead single because it it is very very catchy, um, and it's quite a simple song, and and simple is often effective. So, um, So Far Away is, is a song that sort of deals with the problems of uh, a long distance relationship, which is probably something that, that came from Mark's own personal experience, because of course he was off touring with Dire Straits uh, so extensively uh, during the 80s. And um, musically, it, it has a, a unique um, guitar tone in there, uh, which Mark created using a, a synth controller guitar. Uh, and that's uh, a tone unlike we'd heard on any previous Dire Straits recordings. Uh, so that's that's um, very much unique. Um, and it's been played live by Mark more extensively than any 
uh, of the other songs on, on Brothers in Arms. Um, and I think it's probably because it, it is just so much fun to play live, um, particularly into Mark's solo career. Um, the song has become a bit faster than the original and the meaning of its lyrics uh, has kind of gone out the window because the live version is, is kind of celebratory these days. It, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of uplifting almost. Uh, and it is, it is really good fun to hear that song live uh, as, as much as, as Mark has, has played it. Um, going back, um, on the, uh, lo the last show of the Brothers in Arms tour, uh, of which there is uh, a complete pro shot uh, bootleg, it, it was broadcast across Australia and New Zealand, um, they played a sort of a calypso version of it, um, on which Mark played uh, a Spanish guitar. Um, his Gibson Chet Atkins and um, and the song eventually goes into its full-blown sort of rock pop version but a lot of fans say that's their that's their favorite version um, but it is um, a great um, opening track as I say very simple and, and very effective and the next track of course is Money for Nothing now Money for Nothing is without question one of Dire Straits biggest hits it is possibly their biggest hit um, it is iconic in every way. Um, it, it starts with this gentle sort of synth, um, synth pad swell with Sting um, singing the uh, I Want My MTV line, uh, which is based around the, the melody of Don't Stand So Close To Me. Um, and, and it builds and builds and then you start getting the, the, the big drum build up and then it breaks into, into Mark's uh, iconic guitar riff which he plays on a Les Paul. And uh, that was significant because um, this was the first fans had heard uh, of, of Mark using a, a considerably more overdriven guitar tone. Um, prior to Brothers in Arms, Mark had largely been using sort of, right, well, he'd been pr predominantly a, a Strat player. Um, and he used almost exclusively sort of clean or near clean tones. But for um, certain songs on Brothers in Arms, he was looking for more power. And so he started um, uh, playing Les Pauls. And uh, Money for Nothing is um, an example of, of a song that features a Les Paul. And he was also using a, a sort of a wah effect. Um, the, uh, the pedal is set to a specific position. Uh, and so that gives it uh, another element of, of uniqueness. So it's not actually his typical Les Paul tone. His typical Les Paul tone is, is, is usually a bit richer, uh, but the wah pedal is, is bringing it something slightly different to it. Um, now the song was, uh, I'm sure many people have heard this story already, but the song was inspired when um, Mark was in an electrical appliance store somewhere. And there was a, there was a, a, a big guy who worked there um, who was shifting, I don't know, fridges and TVs and what have you. Um, and all the TVs in the store were tuned to MTV. And, and the guy was standing there looking at the TVs um, and commenting on, on the artists who, who, were, uh, who were on the screen. And, um, and uh, Mark thought that the, the lines this guy was coming out with was, were so good that he, he, asked for a, he asked for a notepad and a, and a pen. And he sat in, down in the kitchen area or something and, and he, he wrote some of these lines down and a lot of the lines that came from this guy ended up in the song, which I think is a great story, you know. And that is, it's, it's the way that Mark works, you know, it's the, the journalistic instincts that he has to, to do that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, there's the story of, of how Sting ended up on, on, uh, on the record. Now, um, when they were recording it, uh, there were actually numerous stories uh, about this, but... Um, but uh, according to Mark, uh, when they were recording the song, uh, he felt that it, he wanted Sting's voice on there. It turned out that Sting was actually, he just happened to be on Montserrat at the time, um, he, you know, with the windsurfers, you know. So he, um, so, uh, he got in touch, Sting came into the studio and uh, he recorded his um, backing vocal part and that became a significant element of the song. Uh, and it ended up also being credited. The song ended up being credited to, to Mark Muffler and Sting because it uses elements of Don't Stand So Close To Me, which apparently is not something that Sting had expected. It's something that, uh, that came from his publishing company, um, which apparently he was a little bit embarrassed about. But um, 
so that's Money for Nothing, a hugely iconic song, and um, and that gives way to Walk of Life, which um, itself was also, I mean, that one and Money for Nothing are the two sort of mega hits on the album. And Walk of Life is interesting because it almost didn't make it onto the album. I don't think Neil Dorseman was all that um, was all that sure about the song, um, and I'm not even sure how uh, convinced the band were by the song. But I'm glad I'm glad that it did make it on there because I, I think it gives the album a bit of balance, you know, the, the simplicity of the song because it's it's a fairly moody sort of album, Brothers in Arms, and and so Walk of Life uh, balances it, it, it out. Um, Mark performed the song live uh, for twenty years. It was it was it was extensive. Uh, it was played live extensively up until the Shangri La tour in two thousand and five. But like I say, I'm not even sure if Mark is entirely convinced by the song because after that tour he stopped playing it and it's never been in the set since. Um, but uh, uh, but it's it's just good fun. That's 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 the most important thing about Walk of Life, and uh, I, I for one really enjoy it. Uh, my personal favourite version of it would be the one that's on the On the Night live album with that fantastic um, pedal steel solo from uh, from Paul Franklin, uh, who, who defies the laws of physics with what he does on a pedal steel guitar. And uh, he played a terrific uh, pedal steel solo in, in, in the outro of that version. Next up, we have Your Latest Trick. And Your Latest Trick is also a very interesting song because it is probably the least guitar orientated track that Mark has ever recorded. Uh, it's um, This one is very much saxophone driven and it has a, a, an absolutely killer um, saxophone hook. It is um, another another song that's, that's very very well known, maybe not to the extent of Money for Nothing or Walk of Life, but uh, it, as soon as you hear that, that saxophone riff at, at a live gig you're gonna you're gonna know what the song is. Mark again is playing a Les Paul on this one and he's using a very echoey and, and really uh, compressed tone and <clears throat> it, it, it sort of reflects the, the sort of barren imagery of the, of the lyrics on the, in the song. Um, and uh, another thing I really like about the album version of this song is that uh, behind the saxophone melody, you've got this sort of counter melody go, uh, going on behind it, which um, is played on a, on a sort of a, a, a synth of, of some form or another. Um, and it's got a slight delay on it, and it, it, it it's very very effective, and it's it's actually the last thing you hear as as the, the song fades out. Um, so that's that's a song that has real atmosphere to it. Um, it starts off with this with this sort of trumpet solo, um, which uh, sort of sets the sets the tone and sets the mood for the song, and then it breaks into the saxophone uh, the saxophone hook. Um, so yeah, that's that's. Uh, I would say a, a big favourite of mine on, on Brothers in Arms. But then uh, we have Why Worry, which, um, what a pretty little song that is. I mean, it's it's such a beautiful song and, and it's, it has a heartwarming kind of vibe to it. Um, and uh, if there's one thing that Mark is fantastic at, it's writing heartwarming songs. Uh, that's particularly evident going into his solo career. But uh, Why Worry is a lovely little song and... Um, it's a simple message, uh, you know. It, it's not. It's not too deep. Uh, it's just, you know, it, the, the title of, of the song kind of sums it up, really. Um, some lo lovely, uh, gentle guitar picking on, on this song, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, it has this extended outro um, with some subtle um, fills and solos in there. Um, and uh, I listened to this album actually not so long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, for the first time in quite a while actually. And um, when I was listening to that song, I was getting a, a slightly emotional actually, because because the um, Brothers in Arms, I, I first heard um, the album when um, I was in the process of discovering Mark's music. And so every time I listen to it, it really takes me back to the time that I, that I, I was first discovering Mark's music. And uh, um, so that's a song that means means a, a good deal, a good deal to me. So that's why worry, um, and then we have the man. Uh, sorry, uh, worry across the river. 
uh, right across the river. Uh, that's another um, song that, that has a, a certain atmosphere about it, um, a certain ambience about it. It has this sort of um, jungle sound effect that's, that's looping in, in the background. It's the first thing you hear on the song, or one of the first things you hear anyway. And um, a, a, a really echoey, sort of overdriven guitar tone, um, which uh, again really adds to the, the atmospheric element of the song. Um, not a huge amount I can say about Right Across the River, but it, it, it's just another song on the album that has real atmosphere to it. And then we have The Man's Too Strong. Now, The Man's Too Strong is a lesson to any aspiring songwriter as to how to end a song. Uh, there is something really, really special about the combination of the instrumentation and the chord changes in the outro of, of this song. It is the perfect ending. Um, and it, it is the highlight of the song. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's so well put together. Uh, lyrically, it's very interesting as well. It, it's, it's a great song all around. But uh, the ending of the song in particular is, is just, it might be one of my, well, it, it is, it is one of my all-time favourite song endings. Um, so that's, uh, that's The Man's Too Strong, and, and unfortunately Mark's not performed it live very much over the years. I believe he did consider it um, a number of years ago for one of his solo tours, but it got um, it replaced essentially by um, uh, Hill Farmer's Blues. Not that I'm complaining about that, because that also is fantastic live, but uh, I would love to hear The Man's Too Strong live. I very much doubt whether, whether Mark's watching this, but I would love to hear The Man's Too Strong live, I really would. Um, so that gives way to One World. Uh, one World, uh, that one is perhaps the most of its time song on Brothers in Arms. It, it, it does sound very 80s, especially with that big sort of slap bass that you can hear um, uh, in the intro. Uh, apparently Mark was not brilliantly pleased with that song. Uh, and when they played it live, they played it slightly differently in a way that was apparently closer to, to how Mark um, may have wanted, uh, may have envisaged the song. Um, but, you know, it's a very, very catchy song and, and um, it, it is excellent lyrically as well. Uh, it's, it's got some terrific lyrics to it. Uh, you know, can't get no antidote for blues. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, antidote for blues is, is a good sort of uh, um, summing up of Brothers in Arms because it is my antidote for blues. Um, so that's, that's one world. And then it closes with the title track, Brothers in Arms. Now, on most of Mark's albums since Brothers in Arms, he has ended the album with a track that is either a sort of a tug of the heartstrings or is, um, or is in some way profound. And Brothers in Arms is, is one such example. Um, it's written from the point of view, um, quite obviously, from, from a, um, a dying soldier. And... Um, the funny thing with Brothers in Arms is that when you first listen to it, um, it may not get to you. You may not get it the first time you, you hear it. But with increased listening, you begin to realise just how profound that song is. And it's a song that means a great deal uh, to people, particularly people in the armed forces. Uh, in fact, the song was used um, oh, uh, um, just over 20 years later to raise funds for uh, a charity that was taking um, uh, Falklands veterans back to the Falklands so they could sort of exercise their ghosts. Um, and uh, so it, 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 is, it is a song that means uh, a, a lot uh, to, to people in, in the armed forces, but just generally it, 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 it has a real atmosphere to it and, and it's, it's the perfect way to close the album with, with that uh, guitar solo and, and the fade out. And um, it's another example of, of Mark just knowing how to end a song, and in this case, end an album. Uh, he always finds the perfect way to, to, to end albums. Um, there have been other examples since then, such as uh, Are We In Trouble Now and, and Old Pigweed. Um, and uh, Brothers in Arms is just a, a wonderful way, a thought-provoking way to, uh, to end what is really a very very special album. So just a quick word about about the tour. Uh, I mean the, Bro the Brothers in Arms tour very much reflected um, the immense success of the album because 
apparently the tour was originally supposed to have been about six months and it ended up being a year. Um, you know, they were playing these massively extended residencies. You know, they played over 20 nights in a row. I think it was 21 or 22 nights in a row at the Entertainment Centre in Sydney at the end of the tour. Uh, the very last show of that run, uh, consequently the last show of the tour, um, was broadcast across Australia and New Zealand and consequently it is... Um, it, it, it circulates as a, as a pro shot um, bootleg and uh, it, it's out there on YouTube if you want to see it. it it's a fantastic show. Um, they also played a, a, a big long extended residency at uh, Wembley Arena and it was during that residency that they played um, their set at, uh, at Live Aid and they played Songs of Swing and Money for Nothing with Sting. Um, and uh, after they'd uh, completed their set they, they just walked across the road to Wembley Arena and, and played their set, you know. And every, everything just exploded, you know, for, for Dire Straits at this point. You know, they, 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 I don't think anybody could really have, have anticipated just how big the band would become with Brothers in Arms. I think, it, I think they probably expected Brothers in Arms to be the biggest album uh, yet, but not to the extent that it actually became. Uh, it was absolutely humongous. And... Um, and the, the, the tour very much reflected that. And how to summarise this album? I mean, Mark is, um, and I hope I'm not speak, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but Mark, Mark is uh, quite a, a self-deprecating sort of uh, chap, um, and he's not one to blow his own trumpet, um, and he puts a lot of the success of Brothers in Arms down to uh, various conspiring factors, such as the fact that it had two. Um, big hits in, in America and uh, it, uh, it also coincided with the launch of the CD um, and you know elements like that certainly contributed to the success of the album there can be no getting away from that but when you listen to the album you realize just how special it is uh, there is no question about it it has a certain feel about it it has a certain ambience about it which sets it apart um, and the funny thing about the album is that um, you, you, would, you would not seriously consider recording an album in the same way that Brothers in Arms was, was recorded now uh, because it was a production that was very much of the 80s it, you know, it, it was a digital production and yet it's somehow stood the test of time and what I think um, makes the album so viable now is just the quality of the songs, the quality of the songwriting, and that runs through all of Mark's career. It's the sheer quality of the songs that he writes. And that is what sets Brothers and Arms apart, uh, as well as the fact that it is very much guitar orientated. I mean, the middle of the 80s was, was the, the synth pop era. And um, it is still a fantastic album to listen to to this day. Um, it, and it's not uncool. I mean, a, a lot a lot of people said at the time that, that Dire Straits were sort of rock for yuppies, which is complete and utter nonsense. I mean, great music is great music, whichever way you look at it. And um, Brothers in Arms remains a classic. It's a very special album, and there's nothing else quite like it.